Guys, I used to be awful when it came to Warfare and CK3. I used to have huge armies with thousands of soldiers in them, and yet every time a small army came along, I would always get crushed by them, and I didn't know why. And to prevent you from that, I'm gonna start a tutorial series right now where I teach you everything I know about Warfare in Crusader Kings 3. Let's get right into it and start off with your army composition. Let's get started with your levies. Your levies are the most basic militia types that you can have in the game. They pretty much just consist out of passing militias or whomever you were able to grab off the streets when you started the war. They don't require constant maintenance in comparison to the Men of Arms, which we will talk about later, but they have the benefit that they are just a mass. Because oftentimes, while army quality is very important, if you just have an abundance of soldiers in comparison to your enemy, you will always win a fight, because oftentimes numbers are stronger than your actual quality. You gain levies from every county that you control directly or from vassals that give you the levy. To increase your levy size, you can gain more directly controlled land for yourselves or build buildings inside of those lands that increase the number of levies as well, such as military camps and barracks. Those buildings don't only give you levies, but they also have the benefit that oftentimes they will give you benefits to your men at arms, which we'll talk about later, or they give you benefits to your levy reinforcement rate, which is very good when you have a war directly next to your border and you need to retreat so you can replenish your armies quick and can get back into battle rather quickly. Another very important factor in your levy size is your realm priest. Your realm priest is the controller of all the temple holdings in your realm. Whenever he has a negative opinion of you, he will withhold any of the levies that your temple holdings can provide. On the other hand, when he has a positive opinion of you, you have access to a third of all of your vassal's levies because oftentimes, temple holdings will make up at least one third of the entirety of your counties. The most important thing when it comes to army composition though are men at arms. Men at arms are professionally trained militias that run on a constant maintenance, whether or not they are raised or unraised. When you look at the bottom half of your army tab, you will always see a rough estimate of how much your levies plus your men at arms will cost you per month whenever you start a war and raise them all. You should have a look at that and use it to determine how long you could last with the current money reserves that you have. Because one of the most important things when it comes to war is not going bankrupt. Whenever you go bankrupt or below zero ducats, vassals will start acting up. Your army will replenish less and less quickly and you will have a lot of problems coming the end of the war whether or not you're successful or not. So well, before you start a war you should always watch out that you have enough money in the bank to support you for at least 5 years. Depending on the size of your realm, you also have a specific men at arms limit. It could be 2, it could be 3, it could be 5, or it could be even 6. And that number is not limiting the amount of men that you can have in those men at arms groups, but it is limiting the amount of separate men at arms militias that you can have. Not their size, only the amount of different militias that you have. What has to be said though is that not every man at arm is the same man. There are actually six different types of men at arms. Skirmishers, archers, light cavalry, spearmen, heavy infantry and at good last the heavy cavalry. Knowing those different types is very important because when we start building our army we need to know who counters whom. Because every single type of man at arm counters another specific type of them. For instance, skirmishers are very good against heavy infantry, archers are very good against skirmishers, and light cavalry is very good against archers, and so on and so forth. So we should always keep that in mind when we know whom we are fighting. For instance, when you're fighting the Mongols, you can think that they will not have that many skirmishes or heavy infantry because historically the Mongols, for instance, were a nomadic nation, which means they were fighting a lot with cavalry, which also means that spearmen will be very effective against them. A very important tip that I can give you right away is that whenever a new campaign starts, the AI will always, first of all, focus on building light footmen instead of everything else. And that is very important for you to know because we now know that bowmen from the type of archers are very good against skirmishes and it turns out that light footmen actually are skirmishes. I would say let's get into the stats first and let's try to understand them before we get into actual army building. First of all, damage. Damage is very self-explanatory, it's a damage that one unit deals to another. Toughness, on the other hand, is complete opposite to that. It is, you could say, the defensiveness of your army against another type of army. For instance, when you take the light footmen, the base damage of them is 10 and the toughness of them is 16. So if you were to come with a light footman against another light footman, they wouldn't deal as much damage because they would be blocked out by toughness first. Two things that might not be that self-explanatory should be pursuit and screen. Pursuit is the damage that one unit deals to another one while the other unit is currently fleeing and retreating. 
while on the other hand, screen is the protection of a unit while it is retreating against another unit's pursuit damage. You can influence the damage, toughness, pursuit and screen levels of your armies depending on the counties they are fighting in, the buildings that are in those counties and whatever lifestyle you have chosen and what benefits and perks you chose from that. Which is something I talk more about in my lifestyle summary, link is down there in the video description, check it out. The most notable buildings that will give benefits to your men at arms for instance are regiment ground and barracks. Regiment grounds for instance on level 1 would give you plus 2 heavy infantry damage, plus 1 heavy infantry toughness, plus 2 spearman damage and plus 1 spearman toughness, while barracks on the other hand on the first level would give you plus 2 heavy infantry damage and plus 2 spearman damage, while on the highest level they would give you plus 9 heavy infantry damage and plus 9 spearman damage with some perks to toughness as well. If you're going for the archer round though, let me tell you, go with the military camps. Because even on level 1, military camps will give you plus 2 archer damage, while on their last level they will give you a full 9 archer damage plus 4 archer toughness, which again in the early game is just gold. With all of the benefits and stats understood, now let's get into how to build your army up from the ground when you start off a new campaign. A lot of people will oftentimes go directly to heavy infantry or heavy cavalry because they will have the thought of knights in shining armor on horsebacks in their head and think that those are the strongest unit types. And they have some pretty good stats, but their benefits oftentimes don't justify choosing them in the beginning already. They are more of mid to late game units. When you start off building your army, the first men in the army you should choose, as we've already discussed, should be bowmen. Because they are very good at countering skirmishes slash light footmen, which is exactly what the AI will always build first. They also have a higher damage number than them, although it has to be said, they don't have pursuit and they don't have screen, which are the most important stats in this regard, one has to say though. After you've gotten your bowmen and you've accumulated a little bit of money, you should definitely invest in onages or mangonels, because those siege weapons are what will make fighter walls so much easier for you. They heavily reduce the siege time for each county that you're in. Of course, those counties can have special buildings inside of them that increase their fo fort level actually, but in most of the cases, those onages or mangonels will make your walls go by so much quicker that you don't have to focus on having a large army because you don't need to fight that many battles when your war only lasts a few months in comparison to a few years. Eventually, as you go on in your CK3 game and you advance to the high medieval ages and the late medieval ages, you can eventually upgrade those to new and improved types and eventually even go to bombs and cannons themselves, which will break through anything very easily. So definitely focus on those. The next thing that I'll tell you to invest in are light horsemen. Light horsemen are overall very balanced and very very good units. They also give you a lot more pursuit, which is something that the bowmen are actually missing. So they add up to each other very very well. It has to be said though that every that every cavalry type will struggle in desert lands or in mountainous lands, in hilly lands, but work very very well in plains and forests. So you should definitely have a look at what terrain you're actually fighting in. It is never good to fight in mountains or hilly sides. It was always great to fight in plains though, because that is something that is very heavily to do with attrition and defensiveness, which is something we'll definitely talk more about in the next video coming out on Thursday. Now one of the last things that we need to talk about are knights. Knights are noblemen within your kingdom that fight in your army, which will add so much to your army's strength. The strength of your knights are determined by the level of power list they have, and that is also how knights are being selected. As any kind of realm, you have a certain limit on how many knights you can have. When you're a very very small count, you will only have maybe one or two knights. When you're a very large kingdom though, you may as well have 8 to 10 knights in your army at any given point of time. When you for instance have a limit of 8 knights, the 8 knights will be chosen out of your entire court and out of all of your vassals, and from them, the 8 the eight nobles with the most amount of power in this. You also have the ability to force people or to forbid people from being knights. When you want your primary heir, for instance, to increase their powerness and to increase their battle efficiency, you can force them to be a knight, although they may not fit the criteria that you need for them. On the other hand, when you have a very rugged noble that has been involved in a lot of factions and a lot of civil wars against you, you can forbid them from being a knight and then the next best person will move on into his place. A thing that you can change by, for instance, going down certain lifestyles is your knight's effectiveness. 
The effectiveness of your knights determines how much of the powerness is actually getting into account whenever you start a battle. And it has to be said that knights are very very important and people always neglect them. You should not do that because eventually what it all boils down to is the quality of your overall army. That is the ratio between knights and men at arms in comparison to your levies. If you have a lot of men at arms and a lot of knights, your quality will be very very high, up to 4 or 5 even. With all of that said, now you should have a basic understanding of how army composition works, what each stat does, and why armies and men at arms are so important. With all of that basic knowledge now, we can get more in depth about how warfare works in the next video. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I'm gonna see you all on Thursday where I show you how to use your newly composite armies in actual warfare. Until then, I'll see you around.